Cheers! Start your engines! Hit the pace car! What for? Because you hit every other damn thing out there, I want you to be perfect! When I'm driving, I got a guy on the radio who talks to me. It's him. He talks to me. Good evening, race fans. Welcome to the Hoobazoo Radio Network and welcome to Drafting the Circuits. My name is Frank Santorowski. I'll be your host for the next hour as we talk about racing. Joining me in the studio, I've got Seth Eggert, Richard Uden, Louise Torres. Guys, how are we doing today? Yeah, good. Thank you. Pretty good. All right. So uh, this is our annual Easter Bunny 500 show. Uh, I believe it was a uh, our esteemed producer, Anthony Arnold, who came up with that name a few years ago. But this is uh, the Easter week where there is, generally speaking, no racing. Uh, so it gives us an opportunity to just talk about uh, a, a slew of various topics um, as the race, uh, you know, Formula One is just getting started. IndyCar is getting ready to get started. NASCAR is finishing up their first third of the season. Uh, so there's there's a lot of just good off track stuff to talk about, even though there was no on track action. So now, Seth, welcome back to the show. I know you've been uh, dealing with uh, some stuff uh, as well as um, you've been writing pretty constantly with kicking the tires. You're still covering the eye racing, but I kind of I haven't been able to speak with you in a while on the show. Uh, so I wanted to, to get your input on a couple of these newer teams in NASCAR and, and how they're doing after this uh, first third of the season is getting ready to conclude. And specifically I'm talking about um, track house racing and 23 uh, XI, which are uh, now Seth, I know you're a, you're a big champion of diversity in the sport. So between, <laughs> you know, Daniel Suarez and Bubba Wallace, these are, these are a couple of guys who are, um, they represent some diversity, but they also are under a microscope for that reason. So um, wh- what are your what are your thoughts uh, on um, this, these two brand new teams to hit the track and how they're doing and what their future looks like? Well, to start off with uh, track house racing, I would say it's exceeding expectations. Uh, they've been up front uh, the last three races. Uh, granted, at Atlanta, it's being penalty. Uh, knocked them out of the top uh, five late. At Phoenix, uh, I want to say it was contact with, it, it might have been Bubba Wallace, uh, as a matter of fact, that uh, uh, cut down the tire and cost them again late in the race. And at Bristol, uh, Dan Swartz, who had never run a dirt track race in his life, uh, in his second career dirt track race after running the truck race, Drove up to the front, took the lead, and ended up finishing third, which or fourth, which is a essentially one of the. It was a career day for him. You can't uh, discount the fact that it was on third. He flat out drove the car up there, and like I said in previous races, he's been up there uh, for. Yeah, I, th- I thought he was going to win that thing at Bristol for a while. He was, yeah, he was really, here. really on top of his game. Yeah, same here, and uh, it. I was so confident in that he had a chance at winning. I actually looked up some stats uh, during the race, and the last time there was a first-time winner on dirt was 1965. So, uh, And and who was that winner? uh, I'm going to have to go back and look that up now. Oh, I I didn't mean to put you on the spot. I thought maybe (laughs) you had it right there. No, it doesn't. Doesn't really matter either way as to our discussion. I just, uh, you know, I like to know weird facts too. So, but yeah, there is something to know that Wendell Scott did got his first win on dirt. His only win on dirt. So, but it was a couple of years before '65. But uh, still, just the fact that you know it's been that long since there's been a first time winner uh, on dirt anyway speaks also to the fact that NASCAR really hasn't been on dirt in that long either. Uh, and actually, it was 1966, uh, Paul Lewis. Okay, yeah, Paul Lewis. But uh, And that was his only career win. Uh, but Bubba Wallace, 2311 race, and I would say is probably doing as I expected. Granted, uh, 
in our preseason bold predictions, I did predict that they would win a race and make the playoffs. I still think that can happen, especially with uh, Talladega and Daytona coming up before the playoffs. That being said, uh, they're still a brand new team. They're still in a rented shop. They're not in their permanent shop yet. It hasn't even been built yet. Uh, they just got approval to build the shop. So they're working out of what was the old Jermaine Racing Shop, not the one on the RCR campus, but the one in Mooresville that is currently owned by Rick Ware Racing that is being rented out to them. So it's a brand new team in a shop they're unfamiliar with. Uh, Daytona, they would have had a top 10 run if it wasn't for the loose wheel. Atlanta, they would have had a decent run if it wasn't for a power steering issue. Phoenix, if they ha- got the strategy right, they would have had a top 10 run. And if it wasn't for a cut tire late at Bristol, they would have had a top 10 run. Granted, you can't play the what-if game, however. <laughs> right, right. Well, the but other, the but other they've thing, had strong runs. The other thing you have to look at is they're they're strongly affiliated with Joe Gibbs Racing, and they're under, under the Toyota banner. But the, the, the Toyotas haven't been exactly the class of the field um, thus far this year. You know, we've been we've seen great things out of some Chevrolet cars and great runs out of some Ford cars, but the the Toyotas seem to be not quite the you know world beaters that they were. You know, very recently. I mean, Truex has a win, yes, but uh, you know, Kyle's yet to win. Denny's yet to win. I would say there's a little bit more parity uh, in the Cup Series this year. Uh, in part, that might be because of the next gen car coming next year. That some teams might be focusing on uh, developing that i know uh joe gibbs racing is helping toyota develop their next gen car uh so i don't know if that might be why toyota is behind or not uh i know at least for ford and at least Stuart haas racing there's a question that the changes to the rules regarding the wheel wells and how nascar is uh uh inspecting them in tech may have cost them some downforce so there's a little bit of uh, explanation here and there. And Chevrolet just, they've been getting better uh, since they adjusted the nose on their car, uh, plain and simple for that. So it's a little bit of uh, one manufacturer falling behind, one manufacturer focused on other things, and one getting better. Yeah, I mean, uh, every, everything is cyclical for sure. I mean, it wasn't that many years ago that we were talking about how Chevrolet was so woefully behind the the Ford and the Toyotas. Exactly. And I do also want to say there is one other new team. Uh, I don't want to leave them out. Live Fast Motorsports. That's one co-owned by Matt Tift and BJ McLeod, uh, essentially taking the role of Go Fast Racing, uh, which in all honesty, they're again, living up to expectations. They're not, running up front every week. Granted, they've had a rotation of drivers in the car. They've had BJ McLeod in the car. They've had uh, ro- a dirt specialist in the car at Bristol Dirt. They had a road course specialist in the car at uh, the Daytona Road Course. So, at least for them, uh, it, it's a par for the course, so to speak. Uh, not setting the world on fire, but I know they're trying to build a foundation to uh, start better with the next gen car. Okay, and speaking of the Bristol dirt, because we we didn't get to talk about it a whole lot last week because uh, we had a, a fantastic guest on the show with us last week. Uh, but uh, Seth, what were your thoughts on the Bristol uh, dirt race? I know Louise said he thought it was a mess. I thought it was kind of fun to watch, uh, but although there were parts of it, specifically the when they tried to put the trucks on the track in the mud. They were a little embarrassing for the sport, but, but overall as the uh, taking the entire weekend as a whole, Seth, what were your thoughts on the, the Bristol dirt? Because it looks like we're going to go back and do it again next year. We are doing it again next year. Overall, I would say it was a success. That being said, there were some mistakes. Like you said, uh, I don't know if NASCAR rushed or if they just didn't realize how muddy it was when they tried to run that first truck series uh, heat race. Uh, they did quickly learn from that. They threw the red flag almost immediately once it became evident uh, that the drivers couldn't see. Uh, on Monday, when they finally got both races in, 
the truck race was fine. It uh, other than a, I would say a mistimed caution, and what I mean by that is uh, there was a truck that was off the pace on track. NASCAR held the caution until after Kyle Larson had uh, slammed into it, spun down the track, and got T-boned by Danny Bone, which on that, NASCAR maybe should have thrown the caution a little bit sooner. Uh, In the cup race, unfortunately, because the dirt had so many laps on it that so much of the moisture was taken out of it, it got extremely dusty which forced NASCAR to go to a single file restart late in the race. And just my personal opinion, they missed an opportunity at the end of, or in between stages one and two to go and water the track and try to improve it because they did that between stage two and three and it did improve the track. So had they done that both stages maybe the racing overall would have been a little bit better towards the end of the cup race. Okay. Now, Richard, you as our resident engineer car guy, would you, if, if NASCAR continues this um, dirt race as, as an annual thing every year, Mm -hmm. uh, do you, do you foresee them maybe making some modifications to the car itself specifically for the dirt race? And what I mean is, perhaps even go for, go as far as to, you know, remove the Lexan windshield and put in like a screen like they have at, uh, uh, on these dirt modifieds and whatnot to kind um, of, uh, I mean, it's NASCAR. Who knows what they're going to do? Oh, this, um, this is true. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, I mean, I think if you want to make the show a bit better, you got to go to a dirt truck. Stop trying to stick a square peg, peg into a round hole. You know, go to a dirt track, do it properly. I mean, Bristol was fun, but as we discussed, it was a bit clunky and a little bit bitty, and it didn't really have the flow of a normal race. And I, I think a lot of that was because they were trying to turn Bristol into a dirt truck, which it isn't. So if you want to do it in the future properly, build a dirt track or go somewhere. I know the problem with dirt tracks in the US is they don't have the infrastructure to cope with 40 cup teams and, oh, and, yeah, uh, and the trucks and, and, and the like. And, and, well, and, and the traffic and the fans and the facility. Yeah, yeah. I get yeah. that. Well, but if they want to do dirt races, just build a freaking dirt track well, somewhere, guys. Come on. You know, well, do it properly. I think everybody would love to see it. I think it'd be fantastic, but do it properly. Well, if I may, uh, I don't know about everybody else, but I wasn't expecting a dirt track race when NASCAR went to the Bristol dirt track. I was expecting a NASCAR race on dirt. And what I mean by that is, yeah, is that it wasn't going to be the same ebb and flow as a dirt race. Because they're completely different vehicles. They're twice as heavy as most uh, dirt track series, whether we're talking the trucks or the cup cars. They have a completely different suspension. Uh, they, ha- I mean, there's so much that's different. I wasn't expecting a traditional dirt race. Granted, yes, the trucks ran on dirt at Eldora for several years. And there were times in which it felt like a dirt race. But more often than not, the track slicked up and it became a little bit more like a pavement race at a dirt track. So, but I think the problem you've got there is, you know, you're, again, even if you do take, you know, Eldora is a dirt track, as you say, but again, it's, it's not, it's designed for modifieds and late models and all these other sort of dirt races. You know, if, you, if, if NASCAR want to do this and do it seriously and do it properly, please, NASCAR, do something properly. Build well, a dirt track that you can run cup cars on and Xfinity cars and trucks. Well, you know, find uh, you know, you know, Richard, you Richard, well, there, there, there is a solution to this. Uh, I don't know if it's what Marcus Smith hinted at on the Dale Jr. Download uh, about a week ago or so, but um, they still have, they still haven't given up on North Wilkesboro. Why not turn that back into a dirt track? Well, see the one I was thinking here, as you start to bring up build a dirt track, I said, well, they're tearing down most of California Speedway anyway out in Fontana and making it a half mile short track. 
go ahead and make that one of dirt since they haven't really finished the construction yet. They have been fully approved with either, if I recall, because when people were getting all, oh, you know what? Well, it was a missing word if it gets approved first. Well, the thing is, though, with that, uh, with Auto Club Speedway, it's already approved for racing. And where they're changing it, just changing the style of track, uh, my understanding is they don't need governmental approval because it's still going to be used for racing. I think the big thing behind there um, is that they're going to sell off half of the real estate uh, because, you know, real estate values in that, uh, that area of California, Southern California, are just crazy and they can just make a quick bundle of cash, reduce the, the amount of property they own by nearly half. But I mean, if, if you're going to go through all that trouble and, and you're thinking about building a dirt track from the ground up uh, in an area that has the uh, infrastructure to handle it, uh, that's like, that's nearly a turnkey solution. You know, you, you, your other one is to tear up all the concrete of Martinsville and make that into a dirt track again. And uh, just to, you know, while we're on this subject of uh, essentially going to a different uh, facility, essentially, or changing a facility, Chicagoland Speedway, as my boss at Kicking Tires, uh, Jerry Jordan, had, he was the one who broke the news several years ago that Chicagoland was going to be shut down or initially shut down and then parts of the land was going to be sold, essentially exactly what is going to happen should everything be fully approved at Auto Club Speedway. So I wonder almost if the plan at Auto Club would have been the plan at Chicago and the city of Joliet apparently didn't approve it. And now NASCAR is also looking at, in conjunction with iRacing, a street course in the city of Chicago. See, now that one, I will believe it when I see it. The, well, the, the history of newly launched street races that have been successful are, are few and far between. I, and and one, of the, one of the biggest reasons is the bureaucratic red tape. I do understand that. Yeah, I mean, that. we'll see. Let me look at, you know, Grand Prix of Boston, for example. Uh, Grand Prix of Baltimore. Um, the, the only long-lasting street races are the ones that have been around since the eighties. And then we're, you know, and, and earlier we're talking, you know, long beach, we're talking Toronto, but all these others have failed. And it's a lot of bureaucratic red tape and, and see Chicago suffers from the, the same type of red tape. That is the reason they can't get a street race going out there outside of New York um, the New Jersey Grand Prix they had uh, floated for a while. And, mm-hmm. and what this is, because there's what you call legal red tape, but there's also, uh, see, how do I put this without saying you have to grease the palms of the mafia? <laughs> you know You're what I mean? You're willing to consider the surface as well. well look at San Jose. It was nice so, Frank. But, but, I was gonna, but I, look, look, I, I, I grew up in Jersey. I'm very familiar with how, uh, Jersey politics and construction specifically works and Chicago is going to be the same thing. And it's the same sort of thing that, that, that hampered Boston to an extent. Um, so that's why when you say we're going to put a NASCAR race in downtown Chicago, I say, I'll believe it when I see it. And, and heck I might even go to it because I, I, I enjoy a good street race. I enjoy the city of Chicago. Um, this uh, August, I'm going to go down to Nashville to see the street race, uh, for the Indy cars in Nashville, because I enjoy the city of Nashville. Uh, but I, I, I'd like to see it, but yet, uh, you know, there's, um, it's just, it's a monumental task to pull this off and, and have it continue for more than a couple of years. Well, I will say this as at least as far as the Chicago one is concerned, uh, they did actually shut down the city streets in the middle of the night in October last year for I racing, to go and scan it to actually make it for the Pro Invitational Series that they are doing with NASCAR. And it will be the season, the Fox portion of uh, uh, the end of the Fox portion for the Pro Invitational this year, which at least to me, in my eyes, is more of a proof of concept test 
so to speak. Granted, on iRacing, they are using the current gen cars, but to show whether or not it would work and whether or not there would be enough fan interest, I think iRacing is probably the safest bet they could have gone instead of actually going uh, and shutting down the however many city streets it is in Chicago to make a 12 turn, two and a half mile road course right and, uh, you're, and you're talking about you're talking about a two month long track build you know yeah. and this this is this is how i mean long beach and homestead and toronto have been doing this long enough they've got it down to a science i mean mess up the traffic in chicago for that long and 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 see how many of the local residents are happy about it I mean, I you know, because baltimore uh, baltimore it was 100 percent local opposition that, that put that thing out of business when they put on a great show there and had a great crowd. I will say this, at least from the racing standpoint, with the next-gen car, to a certain point, being based off of a IMSA car uh, in some aspects, it would probably be more conducive to street course racing than the current-gen car. So I'm c- somewhat hopeful in the iRacing uh idea that it could at least be a proof of concept granted they don't have to race in chicago i'm not saying it's going to happen but i want to at least see if it works on i racing maybe nascar can team up with indycar whether it's at detroit whether it's at long beach whether it's at uh st petersburg and have a street course race yeah or i mean you know indycar has shared the stage with the Canadian version of NASCAR, which used to be called Cascar, right? Now they call it uh, Pinties, right? Yes, mm-hmm. it's uh, Pinties at, series, at, yes. At, at Toronto, and and you know the folks have uh, enjoyed watching the uh, the Pinties races there and the Cascar races up in Toronto. So I don't I don't see why you know NASCAR USA can't uh, partner with IndyCar. Uh, I mean, we've already got we're sharing a sharing a date at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. You know, mind you. Roger Penske is the great negotiator that, that made that happen. Uh, but I don't see why you couldn't, you know, have the, have the cup guys show up at long beach. Um, uh, do you, do you realize there was, there was a NASCAR race, a uh, street race? Yes. Yeah, uh, on the West this, tour. Uh, and that street, was, streets of Los Angeles back in the, uh, back in the eighties. Yeah. And, and also Tacoma, Washington. There you go. Yeah. So yeah, it's, they ran it's not also Spokane and, the thing about all those, those were regional stuff. Yeah, and the Southwest Tour were more late models than uh, the Cup cars, comparison wise. Right, exactly. Yeah, but that I mean, again, those didn't last long, and they're just footnotes, footnotes in racing history. You know, the Grand Prix of they called it. I think they called it the Grand Prix of Los Angeles, which is kind of funny. We've got stock cars, and we call it a Grand Prix, but <laughs> you know, yeah. Yeah, imagine Whatever, so. that now today with imagine Twitter going well, nuts I, over it. I, I mean, think, the, the term Grand, Grand Prix predates racing. Yeah, uh, you know what I mean, the uh, isn't the race of Coda called the Grand Prix of Texas or yeah, something like that? That is that is true. Uh, it could be. I'm yeah. trying to think. It's not Echo Park, though, right? Is it Echo Park the title sponsor? The, it's the Echo Park Texas yep. Grand Prix. There you go. I was gonna say I know Echo Park is one of the racing titles. Well, in Grand Prix, it's just it's a very, uh, you know, it's a very generic term. It's it's used in tennis, mm-hmm. you know, it's used in horse racing. It you know essentially it means grand prize. Yeah, I think snooker. Uh, it's just it's just well. yeah, but it's just been so closely associated with Formula One racing, and then you know then IndyCar started picking it up for their open wheel races. So, uh, you know, if NASCAR wants to call their uh, race in Texas a Grand Prix, go ahead. That is certainly true. Fingers crossed. The only bummer thing is that it has to be on bump day. Had to be on bump day. Had to be on bump day. Yeah. Well, they had to have it sometime. So anyway, so let's, uh, um, let's move on from NASCAR. Start talking about some other series. So we are Martinsville next. Yes. And I do want to talk about the the rain tire test of Martinsville a little bit before we move totally away from NASCAR. So again, NASCAR is looking at different things to do to try to get these races in uh, when the weather doesn't cooperate. And, and you figure a 
very flat track like Martinsville, if the rain is just kind of sprinkling, you know, but not, not a deluge, it may be possible to race. So they, um, they, they had a couple guys out there had some of those Goodyear rain tires on the car. So uh, Seth or Louise or Richard, you guys read any, read up on any of the feedback from the uh, rain tire test in Martinsville. All I know is that they should have made, I, I understand. I, my guess is they want to do it step by step because when I was thinking they're going to wet the track, they're going to go full bore F1, wet the no. whole entire track, no, not that, just a little bit. No, uh, they, uh, the, the reasoning is uh, not in wet conditions, but in what they are co- terming damp conditions. Oh, yeah, right. And, and that's because if it's fully wet, if it's soaked, a dry line is not going to form for one. For another, there's the issue of drainage that if it's fully wet, even the wet tires and the spray from the wet tires, A, would make it hard to see, and B, it would make it hard to control. Granted, at Martinsville, at Richmond, at New Hampshire, and Phoenix, those are the four tracks this is being considered for. Uh, they're all relatively low speed in comparison to other tracks. They're all relatively flat. So based on that, my understanding is this would help get the races restarted faster after a rainstorm moves through. And this is in part because of TV and in part uh, because the way the weather's been lately, uh, at least for NASCAR, they will have gotten the track dry and then another storm rolls through. Well, if they can get to a damp condition, they can restart the race, maybe get another 50, 60, 70 laps in, maybe reach the end of uh, stage two or halfway, so it's an official race, and then the rain comes in again. Oh, and then if the rain doesn't come in, you just swap to your slicks and then continue yes. the race. Yeah, so, which which means it it it, it lessens the downtime after a, a, a rain shower. Yes. And, and he, even if you think about it, you say these tracks are relatively flat, but they are, they are banked enough that there shouldn't be significant pooling or puddling correct. on the track. So now, now Richard Goodyear rain tires, um, do they suffer the same fate as say you know, IndyCar or formula one rain tires that once the track is dry, they will, they will just uh, shred to bits and be totally worthless. Well, I'm not an engineer, but I will say based on the uh, Charlotte Roval last year, uh, I would say yes, it would basically be useless once the track dries. Because if I remember correctly, Kurt Busch and I want to say it might have been Kyle Busch, uh, both uh, waited until the very end to... Uh, change from wets to uh, slicks while everybody else was on slicks and they plummeted through the field and their tires were burning up. Okay, I got, I had definitely got your point. Well, I was thinking they were going to try it a little bit as to see how it adapts to certain types of wet conditions. That's why I was thinking maybe full bore, try it out, see if it works on the flat surface. But then again, it's not the first time it's been done. I know back in the mid-90s, they did it with Terry Labonte in Marsville, but he described oh. it that it was just bad. Of course, technological well, advances were not that strong in 95, 96 to where it is now. Well, there's that, A, and B. Um, when they tested in 95 with Terry Labonte, uh, they had only planned on doing it in uh, damp slash wet conditions and it poured when he was on track. So it was a lot wetter than they had intended uh, for him in that test. So in part, Mother Nature uh, didn't cooperate back then. And I will say, uh, seeing pictures of these tires, they actually do look a lot like the older F1 tires from uh, the mid-2000s. And the other idea that I'm kind of getting from them is with that street course idea is almost a intermediate tire for street courses. One where 
maybe they use in damp conditions, but not full uh, rain or wet conditions on a street course, if NASCAR were to ever go to a street course for that matter. Yeah, so and you've got to also factor in the the what's the next gen car comes out, which which as I look at things like you like you alluded to, Seth, it's a little more like an IMSA car, um, and we're talking we've got independent suspension and whatnot. It, it may be there there may be a little more area for setting up the car for wet conditions, which is something that doesn't exist on the current NASCAR car. Exactly, and. There was actually a test today at Darlington for the next gen car. And Louise, I shared in a group uh, chat that we have uh, the right rear camber. Dear God, how much camber they had in that car. And not only that, they were shifting going into turn one at Darlington. I read a bit of it. I haven't fully checked uh, on. Let me go check it right now and see the response. But yeah, I know he w- he was having a test, and there was just so much difficulty on trying to put some gr- some all rubber laid in. That's what Raddick was saying in that bid that I read. But the problem with that is, and this has happened at other tracks with the current gen car, single car runs don't put a lot of rubber mm-hmm. down on the track. It doesn't matter if it's Michigan, doesn't matter if it's Chicagoland, doesn't matter if it's Kentucky, Texas, or Darlington. So in part, that's a factor of there only being one car at the track testing. Yeah, I'm curious to see when they're eventually going to have multiple cars on the track. And I, also, tr- well, I they think... tried to, they, real quick, they tried already a road course. That was Daytona. But outside of that, it's just only been Daytona, right? With the yeah, next they, they, they did two cars at Charlotte last fall, I mm-hmm. want to say. I now that wanna, one I remember, and I and mind you, one car is owned by NASCAR and was built by NASCAR and RCR. Right, for that That's the yeah. one. And the other car that was built was actually built by Action Express Racing and IMSA Team, mm-hmm. which is, if I remember correctly, co-owned by Jim France. Uh, that aside, I believe they also just uh, had the third car built, which one is essentially a Chevy, one is a Ford, one is a Toyota. Um, And I believe they're supposed to have all three tests after the Coke 600 is the next time there's multiple on track. And if I remember correctly, it's late June, early July, that every team is supposed to have one car available to them to test with. Granted, it would be a NASCAR sanctioned tests, yeah. but I believe that's the current timeline. All right. Now, uh, Richard, are you still with us? Cause I, I I'm wanted... here. okay. All right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you missed the last question. No gold star from teacher for you, but oh, I, sorry, I, I had I... an issue with the, uh, the old headphones. Uh, the cut out. Sorry. Oh, that's okay. I understand fully. Um, but I just want to get your 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 input on what we were talking about. Was that the uh, the next gen car is set up more mm-hmm. like a, like an IMSA car? So does this? Yeah. Is this going to be a little more? Are there are there more areas to adjust on the car that could set it up for perhaps a damp conditions at a Martinsville or a New Hampshire? I don't think you're necessarily going to see something that's more compliant in the wet. I mean, that's a pretty sort of uh generic and standard configuration there really um you know your your tire contact is going to be your tire contact patch no matter what you're not no matter what you're running whether it's a um you know a current generation or next generation car how you go about achieving the optimum contact is a you know a completely different story especially if you're going from a dry to a, a wet track you know you, you can't make huge changes um you know, between the two, uh, you know, in terms of suspension setup. So it, it's a little bit of a, you know, you've got what you've got to a greater extent. And 75% of wet weather of driving is purely, you know, driver, <clears throat> driver input, driver feel, driver feedback, rather than anything you can do on, on a mechanical setup. I mean, typically, if you're in an open wheel car, you'd raise your ride heights a little bit. You'd probably... 
reduce the amount of camber, give yourself slightly more of a contact, but you know that then has a negative impact if you do end up in in dry conditions. So it's 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 always a compromise, always a trade off, and I don't think you're ever going to find a perfect setup. All right, good enough. So uh, Louise, you've been uh, writing a series of articles uh, previewing the 2021 IndyCar series. Um, you, you're going like team by team, or or you know you, groups of drivers. Yeah, that's what um, I'm going. Based on, yeah, years. so and uh, those are available on the Drafting the Circuits website as well as over on Motorsports Tribune. And I appreciate you sharing those uh, with us on Drafting the Circuits. But so let's talk about the um, 2021 IndyCar series for a little bit. Uh, we're um, you know after we've got a late start because uh, St. Petersburg was pushed. Uh, to a date where they would be able to have the race. They have begun track build in uh, St. Petersburg. So that race will happen. Um, we'll be starting the, the, ser- the series at Barber uh, in uh, just a couple of weeks here or the week after next, I believe. It is on the 18th where Barber will be. Then the week after will be St. Petersburg. And then after that is the Texas doubleheader. So it's, we're going to get a lot of racing going in the next month, a lot of action. In the next right. Month. Right. Then we'll go right from the Texas doubleheader to the month of May, uh, the Indy 500 coming up, the Indy, the Indy car Grand Prix. Uh, so yeah, we'll, after late start, we'll be like, boom, boom, boom. Um, Indy car has released their uh, television plans, uh, both domestic and internationally. Um, and I'll tell you, if you, uh, spend four ninety nine a month for Peacock on your, um, streaming device, you'll be able to watch all the practices and all the qualifyings. Um, and, and I want to say there's a deal on there right now. I think it's uh, free for one week, which I think is one of the main influences why they won't have people allowed to attend the test sessions in this week at Indianapolis, mm-hmm. just. One yeah, so now that's issues. well, that's uh, that's that that's a situation I want to get into no, they, in, in a moment. In a moment, they, but, yeah, but I do sorry but, to correct you there. Oh. Turn two viewing mounds. Oh, will not be sorry, I can't read. Carry on. Yeah, they, they initially said turn two viewing mounds will be open, but just two days ago they announced that they would not. Uh, and the reason they used would was that uh, they're still preparing for you know, COVID protocol to host fans for the 500. Now, some folks are reading that to. That's uh, like, oh, no, we're they're good. Yeah, they're, 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 they're jumping to the conclusion that, oh, no, maybe the 500 is in jeopardy of not having a crowd. Um, the other thing that caught people's eye was that they had the pace cars out there and the pace cars have the Indy 500 logo, but don't have the date. Generally speaking, that logo will say, you know, the. 105th running may 30th 2021 but the date is not on there so people again are reading too much into that but anyway so back to what i was trying to tell you um if you uh get this peacock the streaming channel there's a there's a code and it's if you use the promo code peacock mania when you sign up for your peacock now peacock is free to begin with peacock plus is 499 uh, a month but you'll get your first four months for 10 bucks uh so 10 bucks will get you four months and then after after four months you'll go to the uh 499 a month so i just want to share that promo code but you'll be able to see all of the all of the practice all of the qualifying uh then the races i believe we have nine races on network tv this year uh the rest will be on nbcsn and they've it, announced the international packages they've got a a wide range of carriers providing internationally. Uh, so uh, IndyCar has really uh, got a good uh, uh, television package for this year. When we, you know, all things it's considered. Pro- it's progress. The question is after 2021. That is the big mystery because this this is a contract year. And also a quick side note, when you said Peacock Mania, I was like, what, does this have to do with WrestleMania, which is also this weekend as well, the two-day event, which – all right, whatever, but I think that's probably the they're trying to use the wrestling to sign people up for Peacock. Yeah, and because now the so WWE that's... Network is no longer a thing in the States. It still is everywhere else but the States because now right. it's on Peacock. <clears throat> right, but this this same promo code that you'll use because 
you know, they're reaching out to wrestling fans with that. We'll get you your first four months for $10 total. And then you go for four ninety nine a month. But I mean, at the end of the day, you know, five bucks a month for a streaming channel uh, is not that is, you know, five bucks a month is not that, you know, crippling of a cost, even though some people like to complain that all race coverage should be free, but you know, we don't live in the 1950s anymore. Yeah, um, you know, we don't have Chesterfield cigarette commercials paying yeah, for everything. No, we have pay per views like they did with those cup races at Pocono for a couple of years. It, it, exactly, exactly. But I think, but I think overall, oh yeah, um, Supercross were pay per view at one point as well too. Yeah, but I don't want to talk all day about the television contract. I don't know. I want to talk about the uh, you know teams to look at this year. And you've been uh, earlier. Earlier, you and I and our friend DeHardy were discussing the rookie class this year. And the interesting note that you came up with was that this rookie class features nobody from the road to Indy of any capacity because Scott McLaughlin comes from supercars. Jimmy Johnson comes from NASCAR and Roman Grosjean formula one. Essentially Grosjean is the only one that has some sort of a ladder system background. He, of course he was successful in the junior formulas before we'll go into formula one for what was it like nine straight seasons but other than that, nobody from it. And that's due in large part with the pandemic that probably prevented Kyle Kirkwood to be in the sport right now because before the pandemic happened, everybody was thinking Kyle Kirkwood is going to be pretty much all but a lock to be in IndyCar 2021 after w- was probably going to dominate 2020 Indy Lights. But everything has been pushed back a year. So time will tell if Kirkwood will be in the IndyCar grid of 2022. But as circumstances work out in some way, who knows? Maybe we'll see somebody move up, but you don't see that often. I know we saw what Colin Hearn and Pono awarded 2018, so that's not out of the question. Should to see somebody like him be in it, but time will. Yeah, I mean, yeah, the, the 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 it's uh, opinions are really split on the you know Indy Lights series and and how the the guys end up in IndyCar because you've got guys like uh, um, we said Award who's doing well right now, but had a tough tough first year in the series where he was bouncing around ride to ride trying to find something to do uh yeah. colton, colton herda obviously winning races right out of the box as a rookie um joseph newgarden did very well coming out of the um the series but then you got guys like ed jones who who is back this season who is, after who is, a year off he's back this season but he he really didn't set the world on fire no outside yeah, of yeah, indy that's have, about it right you have guys that Guys like Gabby Chavez, who uh, and, and I know Gabby relatively well, who's got a great amount of potential, and uh, you know his his IndyCar career was rather short. He he wasn't with a uh, top team on the grid, you know, and he he suffered from uh, it was the it was the Andretti Herta merger that uh, kind of put him out of work and put Alexander Rossi in a car. Uh, but could you imagine if it was? Gabby Chavez in that car rather than Rossi, you know, that, that, that had been a, a prime top ride for him, but instead poor old Gabby Chavez runs a mobile oil change business in Indianapolis. This, and this is true. Kyle Kaiser, another, another guy who was a standout in Indy lights is took his scholarship money to Yukos racing and Yukos racing beyond his scholarship money was not able to continue to fund uh, IndyCar to keep his, career going i mean and you know kyle kaiser's shining moment in indycar will always be known as the guy that bumped fernando alonso out of the indy 500 but 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 other than that kyle kaiser is beating the streets looking for work so yeah aside from doing some radios and indy light stuff on the broadcasting side it's been quite the tough road and same for yunko's indycar program because I think like they had before, aside from Alonso bumping Alonso, they had a rough month of May because they were getting accidents. They had to repair the car to get them in that spot. And also the 500 did not bode well for him, unfortunately. So they were just set back and then made worse by the pandemic. So it's kind of a shame to see Kyle Kaiser on in the sideline because I think it will be neat to see how he would do if there was some continuity in his career. With Gabby Chavez, I would be at a, an intriguing what if if Rossi didn't won the 500 like how he did with the fuel strategy and of course the gem that he be, he's become sure last season was rough on Rossi so he's got to have to turn it around big time this season to prove he could he, he's the championship contender that he's made out to be 
after his Indy 500 win. Yeah, so let's talk about some of the uh, one-off 500 entries because they are starting to um, pour in here. Uh, we've got 32 cars we'll be testing this yep. week. This week at the Speedway, which includes uh, Santino for no, for, I don't believe for you. Yes, for, Santino uh, Ferrucci in the, uh, in the 45 uh, Ray Hall car that Spencer Piggott drove a year ago. Right, so that's he's been added to the 500. I don't know if he's going to be at the test. Is what uh, I was saying, but I know that's that was I announced. I think he so. might, and here's why: because he was supposed to run the Martinsville Xfinity race before they put Jane. Oh, Seth, help me out here. Not not Shane. Brandon Godovic is now in the 26 Xfinity ride because I know Santino was looking forward. He mentioned bringing up Martinsville that he wanted to see how he does at Martinsville. But I imagine with that announcement, he's going to be at Indy. And that's yeah. why Brandon is in the 26. Yeah, Brandon Godovic it will run the 26 for Sam Hunt Racing due to a uh, scheduling conflict. That's the way the team worded it for uh, Santino Ferrucci. Yeah, which is essentially this coming test more than likely. Yeah, that's the only thing that makes sense. Yeah. Right. Then the other announcement we had, Cody Ware will be there. Uh, he will also attempt to complete the rookie orientation program before he begins testing. Um, yep. opinions are a little split there. Somebody, I, I forget who would, was it told me they said, yeah, they're afraid Cody Ware is going to kill himself out there. Um, that was a, uh, it was a race team owner that I will not mention on here because I want to keep that a little bit confidential in that regard. That is yeah, worried for but, his life. And that, and also that, that's a horrible thing to say. It's a horrible thing to say, but, uh, you know, we'll have to just see how the kid does. He's got the, uh, yeah, it's nice. going to be a nice two day long test. Hopefully the weather, weather's supposed to be glorious. So he should be able to get some good laps in there. Yeah. Time so, will ultimately tell, but based on what I hear, he passed quote unquote with flying colors. The question that I have is how, because there's already people saying he's going to be one of the few that's going to get bumped and all of that, but also how he adapt to this kind of racing, because it's going to be very difficult for him but and i know the not a lot of the big question marks before it's all but confirmed that he's probably going to be at indianapolis is that whether or not he was going to do the double this week that rick Ware racing and now the coca-cola 600 paint schemes and they mentioned gareth smithley in the 51 which pretty much all but means at this moment in time cody Ware is not going to do the double the 500 and the 600 but with James Davison saying he's not going to have an Indy 500 ride this season, that pretty much seals the deal that Cody might be in that car in the third Rick Ware Dale Coyne race car. With yeah, I'm not. I, I, I'm not entirely sure that the next person. The, I'm not entirely sure that the next person to attempt the double should be Cody Ware. Well, um, this year it uh, will I be just, with and, Smithley in the 51 just, at this moment. Right, right. Yeah. Just, just to add to this, though, granted. Things are getting better with the vaccines with COVID right now. However, I do want to bring this up. There, with the IndyCar bubble and the NASCAR bubble, I'm not sure it would be possible for anyone to do the double this year. That's a very good point, Seth. Yeah, because you, you, you're, you're talking, you, you're, you're traveling right to uh, another destination. So, and usually they want you to quarantine a bit when you, when you, uh, travel yeah. before and they don't probably, although yeah, they so. don't have like the budget they get like a, a charter plane or whatever to get from indy to charlotte compared to the guys that have done it like robbie gordon tony stewart john andretti and kurt bush yeah so the other uh, announcement that was not really a secret because we all probably expected it was uh sage Karam uh dr- driving for dry reinbold um he's uh, been at the 500 for them for the last couple years uh so you know Sage, Sage will be there at the test. Um, while Montoya will be at the test, they they release his delivery uh, and his car number. So he's driving the car number 86, which is the number Peter Revson drove at the Indy 500 for McLaren back in the 70s. Um, and the car looks beautiful. Now, speaking of cars that don't look beautiful, they announced <laughs> Marco Andretti's delivery today. Well, I figure you were going to mention Marco Andretti's delivery. It's an interesting color. But it remind that reminds me of Daniel Suarez's Coca Cola ride. One of the Coca Cola products from last year we drove for Gaunt was just the odd colors. Yeah, it reminds me of the kind of brown and orange Buick machine that Scott Brayton 
drove in the 500 long ago. It also, the funniest comment I read about the uh, Marco's new livery was that the, uh, the red on the car looks like ketchup. And then the other orange color looks like ketchup that's been mixed with mayo. So, but, but either way, but either way, um, Marco is uh, partnered with Gleaner's Food Bank in uh, Indianapolis. And Gleaner's Food Bank, if you're unaware of, of who they are, they are a wonderful organization that that has a great outreach in, in Indianapolis and the surrounding areas uh, to provide um, food for folks uh, that are struggling. And uh, it's a great association that I think uh, Colton Herta ran the Gleaners car a couple times last year. Uh, and then, you know, of course, some folks said, well, how can a, you know, how can a food bank afford a, a sponsorship when they're supposed to be a charity? But at the end of the day, uh, it's really Gainbridge money who is supporting Gleaners food bank, putting Gleaners message out there. And, you know, like anything else, charities have a marketing budget. So, but I, I was thinking about it, like, well, Marco has tried everything from changing crew chief to changing, you know, guys on the radio to changing his car number to maybe, maybe he figures an ugly livery is something he hasn't tried yet. Um, maybe that'll work. <laughs> so, I mean, he's had a, he's had one or two that were not as some standout areas. So, he's oh, he's, 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 he's had some beautiful ones too, though. Mm-hmm. I mean, I mean, honestly, the, um, the, uh, when he did the tribute to, um, uh, his, uh, grandpa, the Mario, the, the red STP, uh, that car was beautiful. Um, yeah, but and slow, just, but slow. Oh my yeah. gosh. Yeah. So, but I, I mean, I wish Marco well, because at the end of the day, I like the dude, I like the dude a ton. And he was, uh, in his interviews today, he seemed really upbeat, really more relaxed than I've seen him. Maybe just doing Indy as a one-off rather than have the pressure the whole season. Maybe this will agree with him because he's, yeah. he's had some he great, to, he he's had some great to, runs at Speedway. Yeah, he's definitely had. It's just a matter of when he's he going to have that one well put out race that I think everybody's still hoping he can replicate from 06. Because it's been a long time that he got that close to winning it. But he's also had some great runs at the 500. But just recently, would you expect him, oh, this is going to be the year? He just had, he's just not been in contention. It reminded me of last year. He was already, he was, already, he was blasted by Scott Dixon before hitting the start finish line last year. But hopefully just running the 500 will probably help him and see how he does. I mean, we've seen Indy 500 only guys still do well, like Castro Nevis quite a bit. And also Oriol Serbia has done well when he ran frequently. So time will ultimately tell. My curious question is what other races that 98 team will be and whether or not Sage Karam is going to be in that 98, judging by the fact that he did the iRacing stuff in the 98. That's an interesting point because Sage and the Andretti's have a, uh, a, a, a a relationship that goes back a long way. Sage is actually from Nazareth, Pennsylvania, where the which is the ancestral home of the Andretti's in America. Um, and and Sage drove for Andretti in the in the Junior Series, so there was some sort of a falling out at some point in time. I really don't know the details, but uh, I, I probably believe enough time has gone by. Uh, that uh, if they wanted to run that car here and there, that that maybe Sage's name would be on the short list. Yeah, it's, uh, that's just something that stood out to me when watching the bit of the iRacing stuff that hmm, Sage in the 98, I think if they want to have a couple more races in that car, the, um, he, might not, he might be a good suggestion. And it's pretty much it's just a matter of time in my book, whether or not that's going to happen in, re- in the actual campaign with IndyCar because I think if you put him in that car, I think he might might surprise people with that one, much like I feel the same with Santino going to Ray Hall in that 45. And I, and I think Montoya in the McLaren Oh, car yeah, you can never count on be, Montoya. Yeah, Montoya, is a, he's a really special talent. He's got, he's got the ability to walk away from something for 20 years and then come back and, you know, like riding a bike, you know. Yeah. So. I'm curious to see I'm just curious how his Lamar efforts, because people forget that Montoya too is in that triple crown battle as well. I think he's, got, he's got, got, got a better shot at than Fernando. He just needs to be in the right class in Lamar. Yeah. Know? Or so. just have be one of those races where 
the dominant fall out and they're in, they're still in the mix. So we'll see on that. But I think if he wins that 500, didn't we talk about it a while, while back? If Montoya were to win the 500, he'd be one of only maybe one or the first guy to win all of his Indy 500s, which would be three if he wins it this year with three different teams. Because then we said like Al Unser, maybe. No, Al Unser won his first two with the same team. And then the last two were from others, right? Yeah, he won the first two with uh, driving the Johnny Lightning car, and then he was uh, in the national travel, and he won his last with Penske. Yeah, um, of course. Oh, yeah, Dar- be with Dar- 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 Dario won two out of his three with uh, Ganassi. Ganassi, yeah, and of course, Elliot won all of his with Penske. Um, I think I mentioned a while back when Montoya was announced that he was brought. If he wins this 500, he'll yeah. Now, now it's clicked on me. He would be the first since Alan, sir. But the first one no, to, to win, win, win with three different teams, yeah, yeah, not yeah, with the a, same one. Yeah, Al Unser has one with three different teams, but he's got four wins, and two of those wins were with the same team. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So anyway, so let's talk about multiple winners since we're there, uh, because we've got nine former winners in the field. If you think about it, um, you know Sato could easily pick up where he left off and be the first guy to win back to back since uh, Elio back in two thousand two. Um, uh, you know, not much has changed at Ray Hall there. Uh, Montoya's in a good ride. He can win his third, right? Uh, Elio, mm-hmm. uh, Elio is a bit of a wild card in the shank car. Uh, yeah, I was curious I, to see how he'll do with the, how the second shank car will do and how it'll impact Jack Harvey, who's running the second full year at Indy car. Yeah, I don't, think, yeah, I don't know yeah. that, that Elio is going to be considered a favorite for the win. But if you look at his record at Indianapolis, yes, he's got three wins, but he's also, I think, got uh, three second places. And and I think he's finished in the, the top 10 or, or even the, the top the top 10, 13 or 14 times. He, he's he's always been there. Yeah, uh, he so, went for a, he went for a, a, his first five hundreds, first five Indy five hundreds. He finished all two hundred laps, only for a wreck in 06 that stopped that little streak he had. He's always he's just like gifted to run well in Indianapolis. People tend to forget he he completed all two hundred laps in his first five five hundreds, which when you look back at it and just overall, that is extremely difficult to do. Because there's a lot of factors that has to boil down to complete 1,000 out of 1,000 laps in a row at Indianapolis. Yeah, yeah. So with Elio, he's it's just it remains to be seen what kind of uh, game the Shank team brings to the uh, 500. But you got uh, of your one-time winners, you know, Will Simon are are in wonderful situations to win, uh, as is Rossi. Uh, who's really been good at the speedway, you know, even yeah, you know, his first win, you might want to say it was a few miles fluke, but he's been pretty strong at the speedway since um, Hunter, Hunter Ray is in the same situation, um, you know, so. And Dixon Dixon, of course, of course, Dixon Dixon has become the new Mario. He's way overdue for that second win. That is certainly true, yep. and uh, and then you can consider- that was the turning point of the season. Yes, Dixon won the championship, but it was a turning point of his season. Where by that point, if people forget that Dixon wasn't quite the same as he was dominance wise or performance wise, he still finished where he needed to finish. But like how he started the season compared to after being snookered by Sato, night and day difference in many aspects. So it'd be curious to see how hungry and determined he'll be this month of May, because I'd imagine he, that's the one that got away from him big time. Yeah. Well, he's had a couple get away from him. So, um, and then the other guy, Tony Kanon, who's always really good at Indy and he's in a Ganassi prepared car. So he's got a great shot there as well, but I'm uh, looking at the time here. Wow. We're almost up against our time limit here. Uh, so uh, Richard, you got about two minutes to let's talk about a little bit of Formula One and, and where we're going next uh, before we'll have to call it a night. It, time has just flown with us having literally no topics to talk about. <laughs> well, after our uh, a couple of weeks in uh, in Bahrain with uh, you know the F one preseason test and then the first first race of the season, it's uh, it, it's a very truncated flyaway season. But we're uh, back to Europe uh, for uh, the uh, Imola race, um, 
the I can't remember what they call it now, Emilia Romana something. Anyway, some Italian Emilia name. Emilia Regalia, uh, something like that. So something yeah, that sounds so like it. It sounds like a wonderful pasta dish. Emi- hang on, I got it here. Emilia Romanaja Grand Prix. Sorry exactly. to any Italians watching who have uh, just desecrated their language. Sorry, guys. Um, but uh, Emilia was one of the highlights of last year. I think you know, being back on the calendar for for the first time in in almost what was about fifteen years almost. Um, so one of the one of the one of the uh, upsides to the global pandemic really was having uh, you know Imola stay on there coming into twenty twenty one. So it'll be uh, it'll be interesting to see if um, you know Red Bull maintain the dominance uh, and what effect that has on their race performance. You know if they can if they can start getting ahead of Mercedes. You know actually on outright pace um, and actual on runs throughout the throughout the whole season. Um, it's interesting to see if Mazepan can go more than two corners. Um, and yeah, you know, just just see where we are, really. You know, the first race is always a little bit of a, of a lottery, really. And uh, I know Red Bull had some issues. You know, the, the numbers that came out today was that the diffuser issue on Max Verstappen's car, oh, sorry, not diffuser, differential issue on uh, Max Verstappen's car cost him about two to three tenths of a second of the lap. Now, they're always going to big that number as much, up as much as possible, but it'd be interesting to see if they can put everything together where where it all fall out at the end of the race. So, uh, yeah, no, it'd be good. Good. I think that's in two weeks, April eighteenth. We're 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 back there, back in Europe. Yeah, April eighteenth will be the same weekend as uh, when the, when the IndyCar guys IndyCar are start, yeah. racing at Barber, which is always a fun track to watch. Beautiful, one of the more beautiful race courses in the United States. But with that being said, we are out of time. So I want to thank you, Seth, Richard, and Louise. Always enjoy talking to you guys. I want to thank the Hoobazoo Radio Network. I want to thank iHeartRadio, Spreaker, Google Podcasts, and YouTube. And I want to thank you folks who listen to us week in and week out. Until then, good night. Enter your website. Enter your website. Enter your website. Enter your website.